and welcome to the Friday afternoon colloquium series, jointly sponsored by the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine and the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. Today we have a special installment of that series in conjunction with a grant project that I and several others are on for the next couple of years called From Biological Practice to Scientific Metaphysics. Um, I encourage you to uh, let your fingers do the walking on the web and go to From Biological Practice to Scientific Metaphysics.org and you can read more about the project. Part of that uh, project is a variety of activities, um, one of which are opportunities to uh, communicate some of those ideas to a wider audience. And uh, it is my pleasure that Mark Arashevsky, uh, a member of that team, is here today with us. Uh, Mark is coming to us from the Department of Philosophy at the University of Calgary, uh, where he is a professor of philosophy, um, has been there uh, for um, the bulk of his career. Um, he's published a number of important uh, books and papers. I'll mention a couple of uh, both. In terms of books, uh, a well-known edited volume, The Units of Evolution, Essays on the Nature of Species, and The Poverty of the Linnaean Hierarchy, a Philosophical Study of Biological Taxonomy. The things that he has been writing about most recently that are connected with uh, the themes of thinking about the connection between practice and metaphysics um, uh, have to do with individuality. And so two recent papers with uh, uh, a colleague, Mac Miller Pedroso, one, Rethinking Evolutionary Individuality, and another, What Biofilms Can Teach Us About Individuality. Um, before I uh, turn it over to Mark, I just want to uh, say a quick thank you to the sponsor um, for the grant who makes it possible and that's necessary for these things to happen and that's the John Templeton Foundation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Tell us about science and uh, metaphysics, lessons from microbiology, if we can get the slides up. There we go. Ah, we're good. Okay, well, it's, it's wonderful to be back at the University of Minnesota. And it's, it's a wonderful honor to, to give the, the first public inaugural address for the Templeton Project from uh, Biological Practice to Scientific Metaphysics. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, so I'm going to talk about three questions today. They seem unassociated, perhaps. Uh, but I'll leave a, a story through them that connects them. But before even doing that, that let me just give you a quick introduction to these these three questions, so we're on the same slide, as it were. Um, so, first question, uh, what is a biological individual? So, this is a, a problem that's been going back at least to Darwin, before Darwin, probably have to, back to Aristotle. A lot of debate these days, uh, both within philosophy and in biology. What is a biological individual? There's lots of different approaches. So, for example, a classic approach or a standard approach is that a biological individual um, developed from a single zygote of a single species. Uh, an alternative approach is that maybe we should think about biological individuality in terms of um, metabolic systems or immunological systems where there are parts to it that work together. Right? So the first kind of approach focuses on the idea that well, individuals are going to be single species entities. The second approach which talks more about the interaction of the parts to achieve a certain kind of system, allows that they can be multi-species individuals. And there's a whole bunch of other approaches. We'll, we'll get into lots of details of that later. Um, should we be metaphysical monists or pluralists? So a lot of you might be familiar with this sort of question. Uh, monists, when it comes to, let's say, the biological individuality. Um, there's one type of biological individual in the world. There's going to be one correct classification of entities that are biological individuals, and our job is to find the right theory, the correct theory, the correct approach. Whereas pluralists deny all three of those, right? Pluralists are going to say that, no, there's, there's multiple types of biological individuals, the classifications are multiple and cross-classify the world, and there's not one correct approach. Ah, how should biological practice inform scientific metaphysics? Okay, well, there's a... A long tendency in, in philosophy to develop metaphysical systems that are universal and overarching. Um, so for example, essentialism, right? Everything has an essence. And if we want to understand what something is, we figure out its essence. And we make predictions, explain some of its features. 
other overarching sort of metaphysical systems people might be familiar with, versions of reductionism, versions of physicalism. So um, part of the story I'm going to tell today is that in light of actual scientific practice, one might wonder if such a universalistic approach to metaphysics is appropriate. And in fact, what, what I'm going to argue is that the case of biological individuality, particularly from a microbial perspective, um, implies, suggests that there is no sort of overarching metaphysics so it comes to the question of sort of biological individuality and, and by implication, an overarching metaphysics to everything. So we, in this vein, what I'll talk about is consequently for metaphysics to be viable, useful, we need to be sensitive to the variety of phenomena studied by science and attuned to the different epistemic and pragmatic aims scientists have. That is, this is where the story is going to go, um, metaphysics needs to be pluralistic, pragmatic, and local. But more on that later. So the, the way that I weave these three together, again, this is all sort of introductory, right? We'll look at the question of biological individuality. That's going to have implications about whether we should be metaphysical monist or pluralist. And going through this process can give us some lessons about how to get some information from science, understand what's going on in science and scientific practices that can help us be, be better, dare I say, metaphysicians. Okay. One other sort of introductory, um, oh, let's not go there yet. One other bit of introductory information I want to give you, just to, to give you some background for the story I'm going to tell today. Historically, there's been a bias in biology and philosophy that sees single species eukarya organisms, like us, as the paradigmatic individual. And that is in no small part been because of our limited access to the microbial world. Right? It's only in the last 20 years or so with technological advancements that we have much, much more information about microbes, much, much more information about microbial species, excuse me, microbial communities or consortia. That information suggests the world, the biological world. Yeah. Okay, so that technological technological ability to get all this information that we didn't have about microbes and microbial consortia. I want to suggest and sort of want to bring out is it suggests that, that the biological world, and particularly the individuals that populate it, is much more varied than we thought just 20 years ago. And an implication that I'm going to sort of play with as we go through this is that we should drop the sort of eukaryotic bias in terms of how to think about biological individuality. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, going back into sort of philosophy or metaphysics, we should sort of drop or get rid of what I want to call sort of a universalist metaphysics, that those two will play into each other, but those are sort of two lessons that we're going to be getting to. So, um, I mean, here's the plan, so you know where it's sort of going. So first I'll introduce some recent work, yeah, recent and also last 30, 40 years, on different theories of biological individuality, a lot of biology. Um, then I want to introduce my example, biofilms. We need to give you some biology there. And then we come back to the question about individual biological individuality. And we come back to the question of monism and pluralism. That's in three. And then, and then four, back up a bit and, and sort of give a lessons from metaphysics that we can sort of gather from this story about individuality and microbiology. OK. So. Um, the notion of a biological individual, the notion, the concept, the word, however you want to sort of frame it, it it's ambiguous, right? Whether you, it's in, you talk about individuality outside of biology or within biology. But certainly in biology, it's highly ambiguous. Not, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that there's multiple meanings that people bring when they talk about biological individuality. So we've got to sort of be clear where, where we're sort of focusing in. So. Um, Right, so when we ask if something's a biological individual, we might be asking it from a taxonomic or systematic perspective. You know, is, is what we're looking at, is it what we're studying, is it a uh, clade or is it a species? All right, we'll be asking that sort of question. I mean, alternatively, we might be asking if it's a, it's a metabolic individual, right? Something that takes, takes energy from the environment and synthesizes it for its own viability, right? But there, it's a different kind of question about individuality. Or, and these are just three samples, 
right? There's a lot more. We might ask, is it an evolutionary individual? And by evolutionary individual, uh, the way that philosophers and biologists use that phrase, is something that selection can act on. Right, an individual selection acts on. So I'll, I'll use the phrase evolutionary individual. Uh, someone that a bunch of us have been reading and talking about uses the phrase Darwinian individual. Now, um, you know, sometimes an entity can be more than one of these types. So that, that lovely golden retriever, right, is both a, a metabolic and an evolutionary individual. Um, where on the other hand, the, the species canine familiaris, right, the species dog, Right, that's a genealogical individual, but it's not of the latter two. Right, so we got to be really careful about you know not using individuality, biological individuality, um, without being specific about what type of individual are you talking about. Okay, now, I mean, I happen to think that's a plurality of of biological individuals out there. All right, or there are plurality of. Um, theories that we have to study different types of individuals in the biological world. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today for, the, for most of the part, the, the talk, is the evolutionary, evolutionary individuals. And, and I do that for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is um, there's just lots and lots of literature and debate on it, so there's lots to work from. Um, the notion of what an evolutionary individual is not, you know, it's an important notion as well. But I, I guess I want to be clear that, that I'm using, I'm arguing for a kind of plurality when it comes to evolutionary individuality as a vehicle for the larger target of, of pluralism when it comes to biological individuality. So it's not, it's not evolutionary individuality is just individual sort of the end-all, be-all, or the only type of individual, anything like that. It just, um, that's where I've dug in. Okay, so. When it comes to evolutionary individuality, um, a lot of people who argue about what is an evolutionary individual, they all, they all buy into uh, Richard Lewington, right, that's Richard Lewington's framework. Is that going to turn off now? Yeah. yeah. Then I'm going to have to... When is that picture from? I don't know. <laughs> Alan, you want to come here? Here might be... Uh, Just turn off your wireless. Yeah, no, I understand, but... Uh, Okay, there we go. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, we're good. I, I don't know when it's going to turn out. Um, so most people are working on evolutionary individuality, whether it be philosophers or biologists. Uh, they adopt the Lewington's framework that for something to be an individual in selection, it has to meet these three requirements. Um, right, so there has to be variation among the, the putative individuals. There has to be fitness difference due to that variation, and that, that variation has to be heritable. Now, what happens in sort of the literature and the arguments about evolution and individuality is, is people then spell out in very different ways what would be the criteria for evolutionary individuals to satisfy these. All right, so this whole, actually, we'll see later, there's actually a whole bunch of different ways that people fill these out. But I'll sort of take this as a given. I'm not arguing that it ought to be the given, but I'll take this as sort of the given <coughs> for which the debate is in. Um, so what I'll go through now is sort of, uh, I think, four sort of popular ways that people have filled this out. Um, and as you'll see, there's a heavy leaning on reproduction and reproductive criteria. So, something that some of us have been talking about a little bit earlier today, the common way that people set up criteria for what is a bi an evolutionary individual is to say they have to be reproductive bottlenecks. <coughs> so what I'll do in the slides is I'll put some names of some people who might be recognizable who hold this view. Just supposed to be representative. So a reproductive bottleneck is when an individual, an organism, starts as a cell, a very few number of cells, and then develops from there. Right, the reproductive bottleneck is the, the few cells, or the one cell. Um, now, people who argue that reproductive bottlenecks are important for evolutionary individuality, they give two reasons. So one reason is um, bottlenecks reduce competition among the cells of an organism because the cells of an individual are thought to be genetically nearly identical at the start. I mean, there's going to be some mutation down the road. 
but you get that sort of homogeneity or, or at least you know, not really problematic heterogeneity. So, so competition among the parts is tapped down. So that's one reason that reproductive bottlenecks are important for, for those who argue for it. Another is that uh, it's, it's thought that reproductive bottlenecks help the evolution of new traits because the germline of an individual starts afresh at each bottleneck there might be mutations, and then those get spread in the soma cells. But you get this, the chance of new traits each time. OK, so that's one. Another one is uh, division of reproductive labor. And so we're familiar with this. You know, We have a, a germ somic line distinction. Uh, right, only the germ cells, they go on. The somic cells don't. Um, and again, the motivation is that it's about competition. It's about, well, look, you know, if all these <clears throat> Um, if, if the somic lines don't reproduce and go on into another generation, that is to other organisms, then they're not going to have as much competition. Right? So it's a way of tapping down competition to get stability in what is a, an individual. Um, a third idea that people put out there is integration of parts. And that, kind of, that goes along a couple of parameters. So one is that uh, there's boundaries. There's the self, the individual versus the environment, right? So there's the, the regular tree <laughs> versus the human, right? So we have these boundaries between individuals. And the other part of this is the idea that there's some sort of um, integration of parts that contributes to the viability of the individuals. So you know, for us, the human, right, it's our neurological <coughs> system, our various systems that are sort of integrated and contribute to the viability of the, the human. You know, for the tree, it's going to be the integration of things that the tap roots, the sap wood, branches, and leaves, and other such do. Now, the reason I've sort of highlighted these, these three um, criteria for individuality in this order is it might look familiar to a popular one in philosophy of biology. This is Peter Gottfried Smith's um, account of what it is to be a reproducer. Well, in particular, what he calls a collective reproducer. But I'm not going to go into the details of that. And um, Right, so we have the three. I mean, you have it right here again, right? There, there's the bottleneck. He calls it repro reproductive specialization and overall integration. So those are the three I just introduced. And he sort of puts them together into his cube. And it's an interesting sort of cube because his criteria are on a continuum. An individual scores between 0 and 1 on each of the parameters, such that there are, by his counts, paradigmatic individuals, uh, <laughs> middling individuals, and marginal individuals. Now, here's the pop quiz. Who on this graph are the paradigmatic individuals? Us. One, one, one. Good job. <laughs> anyway, right, so we're right. So just, just keep a note of that. We'll, we'll, we'll get that, back to that in a little while later. Um, so, one other, uh, a couple of criteria I want to highlight before moving on about um, the people we've used for talking about evolutionary individuals. So um, it's a little bit, a bit out of date right now, but, but I want to put it on the table because it's a bridge to the next thing I want to say. Right, there's this idea that, that, that um, an individual develops from a single species genome, right? So again, not to have a competition. Um, right, the underlying assumption is that genetic homogeneity, once again, among the cells in an individual dim diminishes competition between them. But I, I bring this up because what I want to sort of point out is actually I don't know how many years it's been now, but this is this has sort of been rejected, um, at least amongst a bunch of people. I shouldn't, um, namely, um, well, let's not quite go there yet. There's this recognition that there might be good candidates for evolutionary individuals that are actually multi-species individuals, multi-species entities, right? So people have sort of taken. No, we don't have to necessarily think about all the individuals, evolutionary individuals, as single species ones. We could allow there's multi-species individuals. And then people have sort of worked on, OK, so what would be constraints on that? Um, so so the, sort of the working constraint that a lot of people, these happen to be philosophers that I'm citing here, though, um, is, is that the different species lineages run in tandem. So what does this mean? Um, and it, this is. What I have here is an example, sort of the stock example that people use of P. aphids, who in their um, livers, and their livers, no, abdomens, have um, Bucnera as a type of um, bacteria. 
uh, that synthesizes amino acids for the host. And people commonly sort of say, look, that, that uh, you, you take a, a P. aphid, it has this bacteria, then the P. aphid has offspring, and then the bacteria have offspring. And so what you have is you have sort of a lineage of individuals, and those individuals are multi-species individuals that have common beginnings and endings. Um, yeah, that's pretty much not much more to say there. Okay, so that's that that's sort of the, the sort of the brief tour of um, some going central ideas about individuality just to get us going. So now I'm going to sort of slightly switch to something else in biology, namely um, I want to tell you a little bit about biochems, right? Because just, just to sort of keep you on, on the page here, right, the idea is there's theories of evolution and individuality. I want to talk about how those are problematic, but I don't want to talk about them problematic in the sense that we have to accept or reject certain theories. It's just that we ought to be pluralistic about what is a, what is a biological individual, in particular evolutionary individual. And I use, and people I've worked with, we use biofilms as sort of the case for doing that. So now I do, need to do a little bit of digression about biofilms, which some of you study. I learned on the way to the washroom. Okay, so um, biofilms. Um, so the communities of bacteria, if, if you didn't know that already, they're all around us. They're all through us, right? We have our dental plaque, those are biofilms. Uh, in our guts, there's biofilms. In our hearts, there's biofilms. In our heater vents, there's biofilms. In the ponds, when they unfreeze, there's biofilms. On pretty much any wet surface, there's a biofilm. Well, any wet surface that's been around a while hasn't had antimicrobial agents on it. Now, the reason we use, so Macmillan Pedestro, someone I've worked with on this, the reason we use biofilms as, a, as an example is, is a couple of ones. I mean, one is that they're incredibly well researched, right? We're looking for an example of sort of microbial consortia where there's a lot of information about them. It so happens that in dentistry, they study biofilms. In medicine, they study biofilms. In civil engineering, they, well, not civil engineering. What do I have here? What kind of engineering? Um, industrial engineering, they study biofilms. So there's just all this empirical, conceptual information about biofilms that for someone who's not working in the lab, it's really nice that you can, there's this literature and research to go to. The other reason we look at biofilms is because standardly philosophers of biology, when they talk about symbiosis, they like to talk about two species um, um, consortia, sort of the aphid and, and Buckner is an example of that. But, but the biofilms are a lot more complicated and a lot more complex. And they, they, they sort of fit the role, and we're going to get to this later, but using actual examples to think about your metaphysics, because they're complex and hard in unexpected ways. Right? It's not a cooked up example. It's not a simplified example. But on the other hand, they have a lot of features, and this is what I'll do right now, that they start sounding not so much like communities or ecosystems, but something closer to individuality. So let, let, me, let me go through some of the stuff about bacteria. Excuse me about biofilms. Okay, so first off, um, most of them comprise of multiple species, natural ones. Uh, dental plaque can have up to 100, if not more, species. You can go on about that. Um, they're typically thought to have life cycles. They start as uh, over in number five and sort of planktonic when they're by themselves. They go off, then they, there's attachment, they start a new biofilm, there's colonization, the building of a biofilm, often through multiple stages with different bacterial species colonizing in sequential order. There's growth, colonial production, which is regulated and coordinated through quorum sensing, which I'll get to in a minute, and dispersal eventually. So let me talk about some of these features. Um, so one thing that they, they make during growth is they make this thing called an extra, extracellular palmaric substance, which does a bunch of things. Uh, a biofilm's EPS provides a biofilm with structural integrity. It traps nutrients from the environment and it contains enzymes that break those nutrients down for digestion by the biofilm's bacteria. 
It protects bacteria from predators and antibiotics by providing a protective layer and containing molecules that bind to the antimicrobial agents, prevent them from attacking the bacteria. The EPS is served as a media for communication, we'll get to that in a minute, and also as a media for lateral gene transfer. So what is this thing, this communication quorum sensing? Bacteria cells within a biofilm use quorum sensing, which is the secretion of, of, of uh, molecules called autoinducers. Auto right? So different bacteria, while they're building the, the biofilm EPS, they're also exuding this, this chemical molecule, which other bacteria are detecting as well. And that way they regulate growth. Right? Different bacteria sometimes are, are growing different parts, different functional units. Um, One last little bit about biofilms, and then we're going to back out of all this biology I've been throwing at you. Um, lateral gene transfer. So there's lots of lateral gene transfer uh, within biofilms. And this is done by several mechanisms. I think the first two are the primary ones. Transformation, which is where uh, what they call uh, environmental DNA gets taken into a, a different bacterium. Congregation is when the sort of cells uh, I mean, sort of protein tubes from which it's transferred. <coughs> How frequent is lateral gene transfer? Well, this, it's hard to get concrete numbers, but I'll give you a quote there about someone who thinks it's a lot. And um, there's other quotes I have to that extent. I'll, uh, I'll move on. So, okay, so what I've done so far is I said, okay, so here's some common ideas about evolution and individuality. And then I said, oh, I want you to think about biofilms. So here, here's where this is going. I want to sort of ask, okay, so biofilms. Do they satisfy this common reproductive criteria for what it is to be an evolutionary individual? Right, that's where this is going. So there's a spoiler alert. No, they don't. Right, biofilms fail reproductive criteria for individuality, yet they're good candidates for it. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of go through some of the biology that, that we've, we've been doing to sort of see that. Um, but. I mean, just to sort of see where we're going with this, why I'm doing this. Um, I mean, it's twofold. I mean, one is to build this case for pluralism, and then the other is to show that a careful attention to scientific practice is a better way to do our scientific metaphysics, right? And, and all these details, all this biology is, is, is in a sense doing the latter, ultimately. OK, so good old reproductive bottlenecks. Nope, they don't do this. They form by aggregation, right? So I was talking about how they colonize and then they grow. The colonization and aggregation is bacteria come together. They come in a sequential order. There's actually things that are first colonized or that are good adhesive, and there's ones that are sort of mediate, other ones that stick to that. So they don't, they don't have a reproductive bottleneck, right? There's hundreds of bacteria coming together by aggregation in a sequential order often. Um, the interesting thing, is, right, right. so there's no one particular cell or a handful of cells, right? There's all these different bacteria through aggregation. The interesting thing, it's sort of the, from the sort of individuality question, is that um, even though biofilms lack reproductive bottlenecks, they actually have other mechanisms that perform the functions which reproductive bottlenecks are supposed to perform. Right. So just, just a couple of them. Um, something called ecological bottlenecks, which decreases the population of a biofilm due to environmental factors. Uh, and that sort of taps down genetic heterogeneity to get more closely related bacteria in a biofilm. Right? So it gets tapping down that, that genetic competition. Lateral gene transfer promotes the genetic relatedness as well, and it promotes new traits. Right? So there's lots of discussion about how new diseases evolve due to lateral gene transfer. OK, so um, the implication here is that, look, reproductive bottlenecks are not necessary for individuality, that there are other means for promoting individuality without reproductive bottlenecks. OK. Um, <coughs> division of reproductive labor, no, they don't have a germ summit distinction. Now, there is some distinction within them. 
So the, the bacteria that go off and colonize and make new biofilms, they're, they're mobile. They're not attached, right? Whereas a lot of the, the bacteria in a biofilm can't do that. Right, so there is there is some distinction, but it's it, it, it's 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 a far cry from the sort of germ somic distinction that we find in in us. Um, single species entities. Are, I've already you know, talked about. No, they're naturally usually multi species, and this example, which happens to be a tental plot, which is you know all of you probably have a little bit of somewhere. Uh, the different colors are supposed to represent different species. Um, and this whole idea about the species lineage is running in tandem, well, no, right? They colonize in a successive way in a certain, often in a certain pattern. They don't all come together at once, right? So, I mean, what biofilms are doing here, what this example is doing here, is just trying to really break up this idea that we have these nice packages of life where the organism, you know, has a clean beginning and ending, and you know, sort of the gene lineages or the parts that in it are those boundaries as well. Well, actually, I shouldn't even set it up that way. It's not even clear what those boundaries are. I mean, there are, if you go out, I mean, it's clear whether there's one back biofilm here or one over there. But when they're forming, there's not this sort of um, lineages running in tandem. Okay, so. Summing up what I should have went through, right? They don't have significant reproductive labor, division of reproductive labor. They lack reproductive bottlenecks. They're not single species genomes, um, and they don't form species lineages that run in tandem. So let, let's go back to uh, Peter Godfrey Smith's cube. Okay, so how, how do biofilms fare on um, Godfrey Smith's cube? Okay, well, they fail reproductive bottlenecks, so that, that's B at the bottom. So there's zero for that. Um, they're really good at integration. I mean, they're not necessarily as integrated as a cow is. <laughs> right, but they, 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 they do pretty good at integration, I'm granted that. Uh, reproductive labor, well, there's somewhere between and above perhaps a sponge and a slime mold. So I don't, I don't have a fancy pointer, right? So they're, they're somewhere, you know, over there. So they're middling, maybe marginal individuals. Okay, now Peter Godfrey Smith's account of Darwinian individuals is often pitched as a more liberal approach to biological individuality than um, accounts of individuality that specify one parameter as constitutive of what it is to be an individual, right? It's seen as this more liberal, sort of progressive idea of what is an evolutionary individual. And yeah, there are three parameters, and yeah, they go on sliding scales. Um, the example of the biofilm, and I'll say a little bit more about this, was to show that it's not liberal enough, that it's still too conservative. And using Godfrey Smith as a sort of a model of a, a kind of theory of an individuality, and using the biofilm as challenging this cue is also to sort of point out, well, look, there's, there's sort of a eukaryotic, I can't say it, eukaryotic bias, right, in what's going on here, right? Because us, I mean, we're the, we're the one one ones. That's the pragmatic. That's, you know. And we'll say, I'll say more about that. So, so for example, speaking of, of a, your eukaryocentric or bias, let me convey a story. Uh, so I was at a, a workshop on symbiosis, and Sven Gould was there. Sven Gould is a biologist, bacteriologist at Dusseldorf. And he conveyed the following idea, story, whatever, in his talk. It hasn't been published, but let me convey it to you as well. He said, you know, Think about I mean, another biological problem. There's always been this problem about what is sex for. Sex, the problem in biology is, is sex has all these costs, right? You've got genders, you've got these behaviors, you've got this machinery. Why, why have sex if there's all these costs, right? And so, so it's one standard answer is, well, recombination is good for the expression of new traits. 
Recombination is good for overcoming problematic mutations. Right? Some common sort of ideas about benefits of having two genders or two sexes. Now, um, we tend to think that prokaryotes, microbes, you can do protists as well, that they're sort of the weirdos. They're sort of the exceptions. They're the abnormal. Well, Sven Gould sort of turns it on the head with this sort of story. He says, you know, um, eukaryotes, uh, let's see, Gould suggests that before eukaryotes, prokaryotes, right, because they're you know, earlier evolutionarily, had lateral gene transfer. And by the way, lateral gene transfer does what? It helps get new traits through new combinations of genes. It helps overcome deleterious mutations through those new combinations. Now, Swin points out that you know, eukaryotes did not and don't have much lateral gene transfer. So what did eukaryotes need to do? They needed to evolve sex, right? The bacteria, the prokaryotes, they already had this done, right? We had to sort of, we, our ancestors, right? We had to evolve sex to do that. Now, I don't know if this is true. I don't know what the evidence for this. This is some claims about deep evolutionary history. I just mention it to point out that we should not take the reproductive features of eukaryotes as the paradigmatic features of biological individuals. Perhaps our bias towards eukaryotes is giving us a myopic view of biological individuality. Right? I mean, that's sort of the claim here. We frame what individuals are through what we are. And there may be more to life than just us. And when I say just us, I mean eukaryotes. OK. Um, before getting to more, for some people, recognizable philosophical stuff, let me, let me mention one other thing. Now, you might sort of say, OK, Mark, you know, biofilms, wow. No, I'm maybe not going to say that. I don't know what you're going to say about biofilms. But you might say, OK, they're interesting. They got all this phenomena. Yeah, they don't satisfy the reproductive criteria for what it is to be an individual. But why think that they're evolutionary individuals? I mean, I tried to sort of butter you up a little bit with some of their properties before. Now I'll do something quick to sort of butter you up further. But I'm just going to do that really quickly and just sort of refer to an article, because um, I don't want to dog you down for, the, for people who are not biologists with too much biology. OK, so um, I mean, quite simply, I, I mean, I would argue, and others would argue, that they satisfy Lewington's three criteria for what it is to be an individual. They vary. Um, and biologists who study biofilms frequently talk about different phenotypes of biofilms. Those who study oral biofilms talk about those that cause cavities, those who don't. Uh, biofilm biologists fre frequently talk about adaptive variation. Um, and moreover, those adaptations are due to interactions among the parts of a biofilm. They don't occur in lone bacteria. You know, whether it be something like um, the EPS substances that reduce the availability of antibiotic or the viability of antibiotic agents, or I mean, there are just many, many sort of biofilm level, or let's say above. It's not necessarily the whole biofilm, but above um, the individual bacteria. Things like um, metabolic interactions, quorum sensing, aggregation. There's a whole list of them. Um, then there's the claim in biofilm biology that, that a lot of these traits are heritable, right? That there are specific genes within bacteria that transmit these adaptive traits among biofilms, such as genes under, underlying quorum sensing mechanisms, underlying lateral gene transfer mechanisms, and so forth. And then, you know, I'm just going to sort of point to this. There's talk about division of labor among biofilms, the bacteria in the biofilm. There's even talk about cooperation, ways of overcoming cheaters. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I just, just want to sort of put that out there, that there's a lot of sort of work and, and controversy within people who study biofilms you know, about whether there's, there's this thing called cooperation. You know, what do we mean by the division of labor within them? But I guess uh, Mac Miller and I, we, we sort of make that case further um, in a publication this last summer in, in PNSA. OK, so, so what I want to do is I want to weave, weave these, all these bits of biology that I've been giving you into a case for pluralism, and then get on to the metaphysics.
Okay, so, I mean, there's sort of two packets of information from biology. I'm not going to go through all the details, but just to <coughs> sum them up. We've seen that, that multi-species bio, biofilms violate standard reproductive criteria for evolutionary individuals, yet they're good, at least I would argue, they're good candidates for evolutionary individuality. Um, they don't have reproductive bottlenecks, but they reproduce by aggregation. They don't have reproductive bottlenecks, but they have other mechanisms that perform the functions of what reproductive bottlenecks are supposed to do. They satisfy Lewington's three criteria, and then there's arguments about whether it's division of labor and whether there's cooperation within them. So here then is sort of a nub of an argument. Right? There are single species you carry individuals, and he maybe. There are multi-species biofilms, and these are very different, therefore we should be pluralists about evolutionary individuality. Now, I'm not trying to say these are the only kind of evolutionary individuals. What I'm trying to do is just to get a concrete case so you get a plurality. So better that I sort of really make that there is a plurality of at least two types. Right, but I don't want to say it's the only type. I just want to get you know, the wedge in the door in a strong way. OK, so what about the halo bios? Um, so there may be some people who study haliobiotes. So what are haliobiotes? So those are, so we're allegedly all haliobiotes, each of us individually. So it's a mammal, you carry out a host with all our bacteria. So me and all my gut bacteria is a haliobiote. And so some people want to claim that, oh, that contrast that I was just drawing uh, in the previous slide, the single species you carry in individuals, there were never single species you carry in individuals. Right? There was always multi-species individuals. Okay, so I mean, if you want to reframe it that way, that's fine. But there's still this contrast, right, between those who are, those individuals, multi-species that are forming by aggregation, as opposed to those that are forming by reproductive bottlenecks. Um, and there was a piece that some of us discussed earlier today. Okay, I, I want to slightly shift gears and give you a bit of information. Um, we end at, at what time? Now? Okay. Um, so let, let me, before I get to sort of the scientific practice and, and, and metaphysics, let me, a um, couple of things on the way. So one is, um, you know, why should we expect a plurality of, of biological individuals? Why should we expect a plurality of evolutionary individuals? Um, so I'll just give you a little window on that. So um, a student that I'm working with, um, Alison McConwell, she's working with um, John Beatty's evolutionary contingency thesis to say, ah, that's going to give us some sort of motivation for thinking about a plurality of individuals in the biological world. So some of you might know John. Um, I guess he wrote some of this here. And so, so John, I should say Beatty, I mean, right, so he, he developed this idea of the evolutionary contingency thesis. And initially, I mean, he's, he's put it to, to application in lots of different things. But initially, it, w it was an argument against universal laws or necessary laws within biology. And, and just briefly, a window on what he was doing there was, he said, look, you look at something like Mendel's uh, first law, the principle of segregation, right? It claims that uh, genes or alleles on a, in a gene pair on a chromosome will segregate in a 50-50 ratio. But we know there's lots of exceptions to that. And John sort of argues, well, the mechanism that causes the segregation at is meiosis, and meiosis itself is a biological process with a genetic basis, and any process with a genetic basis is vulnerable to change through mutation, so the process of meiosis would change. So there's no, Mendel's laws have lots of exceptions, or actually there are many different ways of describing how meiosis goes because it, it's a biological mechanism or process, a genetic basis that can change over time. And so John takes this, well I guess, yeah there it is. Right, to cast doubt on the universality of biological laws, and also to support a kind of process pluralism. And this process pluralism is pretty, I don't want to put too much emphasis in the word process, but mechanism, whatever you want there. 
it's, it's a pretty intuitive idea. It, it's just this sort of idea that's familiar to a lot of us, that, that um, evolution is a tinkerer. Right, that parallel evolution occurs. You know, I mean, think of all the ways that, that organisms get through water. You know, some use fins, some use their hind legs, their forelegs, some use propulsion. Right, there's all these different kind of mechanisms, processes that allow organisms to get through water. So the claim here is that, look, you can take Beatty's evolutionary contingency thesis and apply it to biological individuality. That Again, evolution allows lots of different ways for genes to get transmitted. It allows lots of different ways that you can get reproduction or production. So I, I don't put up this list here as though that it's exhaustive, nor do I put up this list to say that, let's say, on the vertical transmission, these are exclusive of one another. It's just to give you this sort of flavor. There's all these different ways. Right, so this idea that evolutionary individuality, you know, you're, you're still playing the sort of the Lewington framework, but you can get the transmission mechanisms, the reproduction mechanisms, the production mechanisms, they vary. Right, and um, let me just to, to bring this out a little further, the contingent nation evolution produces a plurality of mechanisms that underlie evolutionary individuality. Right, that, that, that. This idea that there might be different types of evolutionary individuals, or bio, biological individuals, it's not that nuts in the least bit. Uh, but moreover, um, you know, if you sort of follow through on this sort of contingency aspect of thinking about individuality, it, evolution's not done yet. There may be new evolutionary individuals, right? So the contingent nature of evolution and its processes Right, allows, gives rise to a plurality of evolutionary individuals, and moreover, that plurality or our set of what those individuals are should be open-ended, because evolution is ongoing. Okay, let me give you one quick bit of information, and then I'm going to spend a bunch of time on scientific metaphysics. So, um, Right, I've been talking about evolutionary individuals and, and, and arguing for, for pluralism there. But, um, I mean, just to back out a bit in a sort of more general way, I mean, I still take evolutionary individuals as one type of biological individual. Right, and so, you know, if one goes to sort of a list of different accounts of biological individuality you might find in the philosophy of biology literature, there's a whole variety of them. Uh, some of them will pick out the same entities, some of them won't. I'm not going to disentangle it. Anyway, um, I sort of want to move on to get to the metaphysical lessons. Dig in there a bit and then let you guys say what you want to say. So, um, lessons from metaphysics. Okay, so our, so our tour through microbiology and, and biological individuality you know, it actually gives us some lessons about how to do metaphysics. At least so I'll, I'll make a claim here. Okay. So, um, historically there's been a bias in biology, and certainly in philosophy, that sees single species eukaryotic organisms like us as paradigmatic individuals. Yet we've seen that recent work in microbiology shows there's a greater variety of biological individuals in the world than we thought just 20 years ago. Reproduction, Production, trait transmission mechanisms are much more varied, and certainly a lot more varied than many philosophers of biology currently think. So, on the one hand, on the biology side, we've got to drop that eukaryotic bias. But on a more sort of conceptual or metaphysical level, abandon the universalist aim. We should stop trying to get a universalist account of individuality that aims to give the correct comprehensive account of biological individuality. Now, which approach to biological individuality or evolutionary individuality one might use, an investigator might use, is going to depend upon the phenomenon at hand and the research interests. Um, so, for example, an approach on 
on individuality that puts a lot of weight on reproductive bottlenecks, like Peter Godfrey Smith's, is not going to be appropriate for studying entities that form by aggregation. Whereas an approach to individuality, or I should say reproduction, of Jim Grissomer, that talks about material overlap between um, life cycles, is going to be much more appropriate. Right? So I'm not, I'm not I, mean, I mean, this whole sort of idea about sort of the correct theory of biological individuality, it's not about this one's right, that one's wrong. It's more like there's different ones that are appropriate in different situations. Right? So I'm not, I'm not saying Godfrey Smith is dead wrong. It's just that it only works in certain cases. So if we're talking about us, it might work pretty well. We're talking about biofilms, it's not going to work so well. And Jim Grissomer's account is going to work better. So um, this is a variant of pragmatism. Um, um, well, yeah, I guess so. Um, right? The world is pluralistic, complex pluralistic when it comes to biological individuality. I mean, I guess that's what the whole biofilm talk is supposed to get you to, to buy onto. And which approach to individuality we use depends on the phenomena studied and the pragmatic and epistemic interests of those who are studying that phenomena. And then I have the, uh, the ubiquitous toolbox that you get in philosophy of science slides. Right, so, so theories, concepts of individuality are different tools for different problems. Okay. Now, um, this sort of pluralism and pragmatism, I mean, I'm sort of <coughs> arguing this a bit within biological individuality, but the road has been well-traveled more generally. So there's this guy, I don't know why we hired him, called Ken Waters, <laughs> right, who talks about pluralism and pragmatics when it comes to genes. He's done that for many decades. He's still doing that. I'll, I'll let Ken. <laughs> I'm not going to rehearse Ken's stuff here. Um, there's people who work on species pluralism, right? It, it, I mean, I, I actually think the topography, the conceptual topography is sort of the same. I mean, I've got to watch out. I'm an anti-universalist, and I just asserted that. But, um, right, when it comes to species, right, there are different approaches to species. Right? There's interbreeding approaches, like the biological species concept. There's various cladistic approaches. There's ecological approaches. Um, in fact, when I was last year, I was talking about that type of pluralism. Um, and they cross-cut the tree of life, or the bush of life. Which species approach you're going to use is going to depend upon the kind of phenomena you're going to look at. Okay, so again, there's sort of, there's sort of a kind of pluralism and pragmatism. Biological individuals, genes, and species. Okay, so let me, let me turn to a couple of lessons for how to do scientific metaphysics. So, I don't know, now I'm going to get a little slogan-esque, so I apologize. Um, okay, so first one. Conduct piecewise and local metaphysics, not universalist metaphysics. Right? Use case studies of scientific practice as a guide for metaphysics, not intuition, not science fiction examples like Twin Earth. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't use them at all. I mean, they might be really good as heuristics. I mean, thought experiments, intuition, hypothetical examples. I mean, they're really great for heuristics. Um, but the problem is as, as evidence. That's where the problem lies. Such examples might be used for unearthing or metaphysical assumptions, but they serve as per evidence for metaphysical views because, one, well, I mean, primarily, they're often constructed to support a particular metaphysical view. Right? Such scientific fiction examples are not constructed in an unbiased way to stringently test a metaphysical view. Right? I mean, just think about how philosophers or even scientists, right, they come up with their thought experiments. They have a purpose in mind. Consciously, unconsciously. In a more positive vein, as David Hull observes in his A Function for Actual Examples in the Philosophy of Science, case studies from scientific practice challenge our metaphysical views in unexpected ways. Right? I mean, this is this idea about using scientific examples because they're unexpected. We don't know where they're going to go. Right? They more stringently test what we're up to, they more stringently inform what we're up to. Right? In doing so, such case studies from science help us develop better metaphysics. Now, as 
Bill Wimsett writes in his book, Re-Engineering Philosophy for Limited Beings, Piecewise Approximation to Reality, um, the result in metaphysics will, as far as I can tell, will be piecewise. Um, though in some cases, uh, some studies can have a non-local implication, namely by showing that a universal metaphysical assumption or claim is wrong. Right? So claims about uh, you know, biological examples showing essentialism is not universal. It's sort of an example of that. But, but there's a lot of sort of things you got to watch out for here. Because on the one hand, you don't want to say that, oh, I found that essentialism fails in biology, therefore essentialism fails everywhere. <laughs> right? You got to. You don't want to leap exactly. Okay. One other, one other bit to get. Okay. So um, now some may worry that such a practice-based approach to metaphysics gives up on a crucial aspect of philosophy of science and science itself, namely to critically evaluate the results of science. Some might worry that such a practice-based approach tells us that philosophers and scientists should just read the results of science and they should shape their philosophical views of science and nature accordingly. Well, I think that worry sort of turns on a false dichotomy, right? The dichotomy is, you know, you do naturalism or you do normativity, but you can't do both. You do practice-based metaphysics or you do philosophically reflective metaphysics, but you can't do both. Whereas I would advocate that, that we can have a scientifically informed metaphysics that properly balances naturalism and normativity. So in the abstract, very, very abstract, I mean, this is you know, a, a case of how you might do this. Right? Different scientific practices have different aims. You learn about those practices and aims. That's a bit of naturalism. And then when you do the normativity, the evaluative stuff, right? you see how well those practices actually satisfy those aims. So that's a bit in the abstract. And you can also evaluate, well, I mean, actually, I'm probably complicated too much now, I should get on. Um, right, so the species case sort of shows that as an example. Right, different approaches to species have different aims. If you're interested in population genetics, you're interested in gene pools. If you're, um, if you're a microbial biosystematist, uh, you know, you're really interested in just getting stable classifications that are repeatable. Evaluate how well the classificatory approach achieves its epistemic and pragmatic aims locally. Okay, so the other day I was walking in Whole Foods and I saw this prefer locally grown metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> right, so this is that. So, so a slogan from, that could be in, in Whole, Whole Foods, right? Learn your metaphysics piecewise from local scientific practices. Cast a critical eye locally as well. Evaluate scientific practices by the aims of the practitioners, as well as locally appropriate epistemic goals and values. Okay, I've said enough. Let me do one last thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. So let me thank some people. So Mac Miller and Allison, two grad students who helped me a lot about thinking about biological individuality. Thank them. Those are some, but not all, of the University of Calgary Philosophy of Biology group. And, oh, I'm going to get, and uh, I'm going to thank Ken Waters, a friend I've known for like 28 years now. I was thinking about that. So, anyway, so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and build a queue for questions. So, raise your hand and then I'll try and catch people. We start with Roy. Yeah. Um, I'm having a hard time seeing how the philosophy of biology, the first two thirds of the talk, actually has anything negative to say about universalist metaphysics. So, um, I mean, it seems like it seems like you convinced me that there's a plurality of notions of biological individual and evolutionary individual. I'm, I'm willing to buy into all that. That sounded right. But metaphysicians, of course, aren't interested in biological individual. They're just interested in individual. And it seems to me that. Even given this plurality of, of notions of individual within biology, as long as my universal metaphysics is generous enough that all of those count as individuals, full stop, then I'm okay. And if I say class, if I, you know, if I have a myriology that either has infinite divisibility or carves up things finely enough and has you know arbitrary fusions, any arbitrary region of the universe is an individual, and so all of those are individuals, and, and I'm good. Um, so, I mean, what, what, how would you respond to that kind of universal metaphysics? 
What's the expression of the devils in the details? So, um, so for example, uh, Muriology theory does pretty poorly, actually, when it comes to versions of Muriology theory does pretty poorly when it comes to biological individuals. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to argue Muriology theory here with you because I'm probably going to be out of my comfort zone. But um, um, how to? I mean. I guess, I guess what I worry about, it's, it's not like I want to sort of play this counter example, oh, I'll overcome, overcome the counter example. Like, I don't want to do that, but it's like, what is the motivation for the abstract, high level, universal theory when maybe one of the most important types of individuals in the world it doesn't apply to? Then you're going to sort of abstract it at a, at, a, at a higher level. Well, then you have to show me what work it does. Like, I don't care if you have a universal theory. Is it actually something that does something that's useful? And recently, this paper that sort of says that neurology doesn't mean it's a biological individual. Yeah. So that's sort of, I don't know, that's. Dennis. You want to follow up on this? Uh, that particular point? Hmm? You want to follow up on that particular on point? On this point, yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, a similar remark uh, could be made with regard to physics. Uh, uh, Muriology does a terrible job yeah. if you try to make sense of uh, a quantum a quantum level object such as an electron, uh, which, which isn't, uh, in many experiments, is not well localized at all. Uh, it's hard to make sense of a part whole understanding of such an individual. So I think your point is well taken for, for at least uh, uh, biological science and, if, my, if I'm right, uh, for physical science as well. Um, I guess I'm just having a little trouble uh, seeing uh, any actual competition among uh, individual individualist uh, conceptions here. Uh, and I, I was, uh, you know, I mean, for instance, in a, in a very broad way, I would think that the, uh, all of them would be, uh, say, equally compatible with some kind of uh, uh, biochemical reductionism. Uh, but uh, on a different level, um, are there ever any cases where you would have, say, two competing theories, uh, each having uh, relied upon a different conception of individuality, and uh, one may be uh, proven to be a better theory than the other? Globally or in a local case? In a local case. Um, it was hard to hear, hear the question. Could you uh, summarize? Well, let me make sure I characterize it correctly. <laughs> right, right. Are there cases where two competing theories of evolutionary individuality apply to a particular case? There's one obvious winner. Is that the sort of the claim? The, uh, the yes, question? And, and where the winner is determined by the concept of individuality employed. I, I don't quite get it. Is, is it, it, it. It's winning. I mean, I thought it's about competition among the concepts, so how can the winning well, come from the concept? Uh, well, all right, the, the concept uh, presumably um, has some utility in uh, for leading to a particular theory, the concept of individuality. Mm -hmm. Now, you have uh, two concepts of individuality and two different theories. Are there ever any cases where uh, you have, between such theories, uh, a competition that favors one or the other and thereby lends greater support to that particular theory of individuality. So you mean sort of like the overarching theories that are associated with each of the concepts of individuality, right? right sort of a, a cohesion argument for favoring sort of one cohesion in the sense of inner theoretic. Uh, I don't, um, I don't. I mean, there's there's different research programs or different that, that that buy into different bits of theory that they draw on to to sort of develop the notion of individuality. But but sort of I mean the way that I see it, I mean I'm just trying to think. I mean so if you think of more a metabolic account as opposed to a reproductive account. Um, 
there's not the argument right now that, that given the, the biology behind, the theoretical biology behind it, that we should be referring one over the other. Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. I think I should sort of, so, sort of want to defer to a biologist here. My thing. and the sort of idea of plurality in biological individuality. But I don't think most species biofilm are doing the best work for you in both ways. One is that I don't think they are particularly useful. Um, and the reason for that is that I think the traceability sense you are using for biofilm, it's, it's a traceability at a lower level that can be also attributed if we talk about forests, there's also traits of trees that in, of trees that interact in the whole forest that matter. And so in that way it becomes that all communities that you can sort of see and point out all sort of island communities are a form of individuality and at that point then it becomes non practical for biologists. Then it's not doing a lot of work. Well, I think we have to launch into the particular properties you want to talk about. Um, right, not in a global sense. So, should we do heritability? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so that's the one you mentioned. Um, how, how to sort of put it? I mean, yeah, the heritability is going to be at the gene level in the sense that's where the transmission is going to occur, right? But then the structures that those genes will encode for and, you know, on through their development, right, are going to be sort of at a biofilm level. And at the biofilm level, you know, you made, you made the island community example of any community, right? You're not going to have the sort of lateral gene transfer in the same extent. But, you know, in prairies, you have enough hybridization between plant species probably as frequent as many, many cases of gene transfer in biofilm, which I think are not as common as some. Okay, so I mean, I mean, I can sort of play it the other way, which a lot of people do, is that I should just accept your example. I mean, if, see, what you don't want to do is you don't want to sort of take an example that's not analogous. You want to have actually all these different features that are sort of lining up. You know, is there going to be variation? Is it going to be adapted to the level that you're trying to look at? Is it going to be heritable? Is there, is there going to be other markers like integration? Are there going to be other markers like this needs to be division of labor? Are there going to be other markers like overcoming cheaters? So, I mean, if you give an example of, of in, intuitively as a community that meets all those, Then okay, so, so I mean that's that's not how to put it. It's not showing how to put it. It's showing a limited notion of individuality. It's not showing counterexample. It's showing that you know we use the intuition. I mean that's the idea of the sort of the biofilms. We want to sort of have sort of the, the, there are these 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 properties or, or factors that we think evolutionary individuals do, but we don't want to use intuitions about how they satisfy. And we don't want to say oh, but you know, there's a community. We think it's a community, but if it satisfies those factors, then, then you know, intuitions be damned. I guess what I'm afraid is that you, by stretching the definition, you might be stretching it enough that it becomes non-practical. It becomes that it just doesn't have any real use for biologists because it basically, you just can't stretch it anywhere. Um, so, so what if I say some biologists do this too? Is it useful for them? I, 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 mean, you, I mean, you can play this sort of, I mean, tell me precisely how it's not useful. I mean, not that there's an authority of biologists who, who can't use this usefully. I mean, there are some who do, like, or do little, or, or lots of, I mean, I could sort of, you know, lots of biofilm biologists. It's not like their talk of individuality, of cooperation, of division of labor, of heredity. It's not from me. It's not from a philosopher. It's from biofilm biologists. So if you could tell the, the actual particular things why it's not useful other than it's not for biologists, then we can talk about that. 
So look at Bill. No, Bill's next. I, I'm acknowledging okay. people in the queue, so if I point at you. Yeah, at the end, when you were talking about normativity, you made what I think is a very important point. Uh, and that is, you want to know whether what they're trying to, who their means for trying something is, a, is an effective way of achieving their goal. Which means, uh, Gilbert Weil said we have to distinguish uh, knowing that and knowing how, but it shows also we need to know knowing why. And that often takes getting really involved in the science as well. It's not just knowing how, uh, doing science. But, uh, the example I can think of best is how important calibration turns out to be in uh, theoretical activities in science. But you never hear that among the list of things the aims of science, you hear explanation and prediction and control. But calibration, I and mean, hooking up the various parts so you can do measurements and, and have them be predictions and so on, left out until you get in and look at the science. And I think there are comparable things um, that you want to know. So why does someone have a taste for natural history as opposed to theory? Uh, things like this. So it really, they're really, you really do need to know why as well as how and that. Sam. Uh, so I generally agree with the idea that different phenomena, different research interests uh, ought to, to, you can use different notions of individuality as those two components vary. Um, but I want to know that on your view, whether or not once the phenomena and the research interests are sufficiently specified, whether this determines a unique best approach to individuality or not. In, 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 overall, in a local context. In a local context. Right, so the local context determined by phenomena and research interests, mm -hmm. the idea is specify the phenomena mm -hmm. sufficiently precisely, specify the research interest sufficiently precisely, does this determine, in your view, uh, a unique best approach to individuality in that context? I guess, I guess, I, I mean, the reason I'm having a hard time answering because, I don't know, I mean, we don't have algorithms. I don't, <laughs> you know, we have, we've, we figured out exactly who, we've got the people and we know which interest each one has. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we sort of, it's, it's, it, I mean, we're asking you sort of to idealize, that's why I don't know how to answer it. You know, we precisely know what their interests are. I mean, we sort can of I make the, it more concrete? Yeah, yeah. We okay. just sort of do the best we can. Right, so, so imagine that you have uh, a small community of researchers, say, I don't know, I don't know anything about these particular examples, but suppose they're working on slime molds, um, and they have different approaches to how to individualize mm -hmm. slime molds, right? Um, is, are, are, do, are they going to have, do you think, within their community, assuming that they are really good about uh, delineating exactly what they're doing, and they agree that they're working on the same subject, uh, will they be in a position where yeah. uh, they're going to agree on which criteria to use, or can it happen that um, they come to understand that they're using different criteria, but there's not actually any rational way of adjudicating between the two notions of individuality that they're using uh, with respect to, uh, you know, these uh, biofilms. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you're actually a really big question which I can't answer. I mean, I mean, this is like, you know, getting into objectivity and longitude and yeah, shared standards exactly and... That's exactly <laughs> right, so, okay, so I'll ask you this way. If they, 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 it ranks highly on Longino's four criteria for critical discussion, then I'm hopeful. All right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you go to sociologically, right? I mean, I, I think um, Jack. Jack. I mean, Jack's working on. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, there's philosophers and, and, and science study people who worry about what happens when there's divergent opinions. Which way does it go? And there's all these different avenues, and there's all these different factors that are affected. So, I, I, yeah. okay, so we have a lot of people already in the queue. I do have your board on that. Um, so, as quick as possible, ask your questions so we can make sure everybody gets a chance. Naomi, you. Um, I'm definitely on board with the pluralism, um, and I'm, I'm wondering about 
sympathetic from the aims being a, a big driver to where we focus in and how we how we carve out the world um, and I think what works well for some of us in philosophy of biology is that there's a complexity of structure that says that we got to grapple holes for different projects or different aims so, oh, there might be these kind of individuals. Oh, and there might be those kind of individuals. But they're individual with respect to a kind of problem or agenda or aim we're at. You know, I, I sort of think that about, about species as well. I mean, you're population genetic questions. Are you interested in stuff about phylog phylogenetics and for what reasons? Then you sort of key into what, you, what things you're going to chunk out of species. And then when you chuck them out that way, is it sort of useful for those aims? Now, hopefully part of those aims have something to do with epistemic or world constraints on pragmatics. <laughs> so it's not just, you know, we're not just in our heads doing this. Um, but it's true. Rhetorically, I play the game where I want to sort of motivate you about the complexity of the world and all the weirdo individuality. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's sort of this weird thing. So, four. Well, I just want to briefly agree with Maria. The um, study of biofilms is at an early stage, mm -hmm. but I think there's a significant uh, possibility that they will be turn out to be less integrated than, butter, than buffalo herds and um, much more like forests than like trees. And so if you rest your argument on the assumption that they are more like trees than like forests, you may regret it. Uh, well then, I'm going to I'll be like, I'll be like, Kant, you know, I thought everything's Euclidean. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I can do the best I can, right? I mean, I take, right, I mean, there's different, there's different biofilm biologists have different views on this. And well, obviously, I'm sort of taking a side. And I could be wrong. That's, that's true. So, but, but, but we agree that, that right, it's not, the, the story isn't over. Right. Right. At least it's falsifiable. <laughs> All right, so here are the, 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 here's the final questions I want to lay them out so people know they're coming. So we've got Georgiana, Chris, Jack, and then Lauren. That'll be it. Okay, Georgiana. Well, then just quickly, I'll add that to the fire of Marie's question. But I mean, I think actually it's, it's workable if you um, look at um, what, how you want to use that concept. So if ecologically these consortia act like uh, an individual or a unit, then I think you're okay. I think where you get in trouble is where you want to talk about an evolutionary process. If they don't have a high heritability, mm -hmm. if they're tremendously context dependent, then you're going to have a problem in, in using them as to study uh, process, evolutionary processes. That's right. So do you think the biofilm biologists that talk about different phenotypes of biofilms and it being repeatable, 
Well, yeah, yeah, they're just off base on, 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 on reporting well, that phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
because if, in a lot of the talk we were looking at sort of facts about biofilms, but I wanted to be more clear on how it was sort of the activities of scientists or the practices of science, uh, scientists that, that are licensing mm -hmm. in metaphysics. Yeah, so practice is sort of vague. Not vague, excuse me. Practice is sort of ambiguous. So in this particular case, I'm really only keen into, um, you know, if, 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 if you're worried about the metaphysics of individuality, especially if, like, you know, if you're interested in, you know, philosopher of biology is interested in metaphysics of individuality, you got to be really careful about the weird phenomena that's actually studied. So it's not, it's not, it's not that it, it is descriptive, it's not the active notion of a process. I mean, I haven't, dare I say this word, I haven't deconstructed sort of practice versus descriptive activities here. Yeah, um, I have a question about the Bible. Doing so in certain ways is going to serve particular goals that they have or not. So I don't know. Are there? You might have mentioned them throughout the talk, but no. Actually, actually, I mean, I mean, I'll just, I'll just sort of fess up. In, in, in a sense, I sort of the, the stuff at the end about the goals. I haven't really thought about the different goals when it comes to biology and individuality. I thought a lot about that when it comes to classification. And species, and so I could tell a really full, robust story there, but, but in a sense, your your question reveals. Right, I'm using some machinery that I worked out elsewhere, and then talking about it as applied to individual. I haven't I haven't done the analysis for what you're asking when it comes to individuality. So Mark gave us a slogan. Oh, yeah, it's a good one. Prefer locally grown metaphysics. He also instructed us to take some lessons from microbiology. And if you'll permit me a eukaryotic bias, there are some microbes that could teach us some lessons. Uh, just a stone's throw away um, at the Kitty Cat Club where we continue the conversation. So why don't we adjourn there while thanking Mark for the talk. Thank you.